1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Everybody here would agree that no one has to know everything that there is to know. In fact, we would all agree that there are literally millions and millions of things, facts, that you don't have to know. You can go your entire life not knowing many things, and it won't make much of a difference. If you just consider, let's say, Wikipedia, for example, that one website, and you think of all the information that is on that one website, no one's going to learn all that information, and it's okay if you don't. So it would be impossible, really, time wouldn't permit. You think of all the libraries and books and all the world and all the information, and you don't need to be worried if you leave here not knowing all of that. Sports facts, names of insect species, the amount of dust particles in this room, how many grains of rice is being eaten by a man in India right now, tons and tons of information. God knows all of these things. We don't, and it's okay. It's no big deal. It has nothing to do, no weight on the day of judgment for you. The reality is eternity hangs over our heads. And if you're unaware of the stock market, it won't matter. You know what I'm saying is true. There are many things that you can leave the earth not knowing and it's perfectly fine. But here we have the Apostle Paul saying to us, there are some things that is absolutely critical that you know. It absolutely does matter. Things you must know. Things he does not want you to be ignorant of. Things you cannot afford to be unaware about. He's saying, I do not want you to be unaware. In fact, it's so important that this isn't just Paul talking to the church at Corinth saying, I want you to know these things, but we know that this is literally the Spirit of God guiding the hand of the Apostle Paul. So and, and the big picture is God is saying to the church and to this church that he does not want us to be unaware of something. Some people think ignorance is bliss. That's a very common notion. It's better to just not know. But that's not what the scripture says. There is much danger in not knowing. You think about the days of Noah. They were unaware of when the flood was coming and it caused them destruction. You think of the days of Sodom. They were unaware that the fires of heaven were about to fall upon them. Ignorance was not bliss for them. It led to their destruction. There are things that we need to know, that we must know. And here in God's word, we have an example of some things that we must know. So the question is, what? What is it that Paul does not want us to be unaware of? He tells us that he does not want us to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud. What is he talking about here? What cloud? Well, Paul, Paul is taking us back. He's taking us back to the times of Moses. He's, he's referring to that 
time. And so that's the same thing I'm going to do. He took us back. I'm going to take us back there as well as we think of this. What cloud? I mean, this is possibly one of the most commonly known accounts in Scripture. You have Moses, you have the children of Israel, you have the Egyptians enslaving them, you have God pouring out plague after plague on the Egyptians, showing his mighty hand, his mighty power. And he said it from the beginning that he was going to do it. When he, when he told Moses to go, he said exactly how things were going to play out. And he poured out his buckets of wrath upon the Egyptians and he brought the Israelites out of bondage, out of captivity, out of slavery, and now they are on their way to the land of promise. And the scripture tells us that the way that the Lord did this is that he guided them by day with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire. The scripture records it this way, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. This was a miraculous event to witness, to see. And the other nations would have seen this as well. This was not some some hidden thing that only the children of Israel knew about. In fact, in Numbers 14, 14, Moses pleads with the Lord. He does this order and argument that we heard our brother telling us about. And he says, what are the people going to say that you brought them out? These are the people that are led with a pillar of cloud. The other nations witnessed this. This was a a huge thing. You you try to get a picture of what we're talking about with a pillar of cloud. and, And we know that tornadoes just recently swept through parts of Dallas and different parts of our nation. You get this idea of this huge funnel rising up to the heavens. Sometimes you've seen possibly a volcano and the, 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 all the smoke is rising up and you get this pillar formation. It is, a, it is a terrifying sight to behold. You get the picture of a mushroom cloud and it has this big funnel going up. This was not some small wisp of wind. Remember, the scripture records that there are over 600,000 just men 600,000 men, not including women and children. Then it says that there was a mixed multitude and livestock and herds. This was a massive crowd of people. And this pillar of cloud was to guide them. This means that these people would have to be able to see this. And then by night, a pillar of fire. Think of it. This was a time when there were no street lights. You know, sometimes you go out way out into the country. You know, I can think of being on the men's retreat at night, away from the lights, and it's pretty dark. You have the, the stars. There are some places when it's so dark you can barely see your hand in front of your face. There were no street lights. There were no flashlights. These people did not have those things. So what did the Lord do? Well, he said that's by night, that they could travel by night. He was to them and a pillar of fire. And Paul is telling us, I don't want you to be unaware of the fact that all, all of the people were under this cloud. They were all under this same miracle. There wasn't a special cloud for Moses and Miriam and Aaron. There wasn't one for the children and one for the men. Everybody was under the same cloud. And he keeps going. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So you know what he's talking about. They all passed through the sea. God opened the Red Sea and the people of God walked through on dry land. We keep being reminded of this, that it's very possible for us to be so used to hearing about a story that it stops amazing us. It stops shocking us. It stops causing us to be in awe. I remember our brother Jeff Peterson, uh, he, he was telling us that everything is awesome now. 
The world is used awesome all the time. And the reality that there are some things that should provoke awe in us. And this is one of them. God opened the sea and the people walked through on dry land. Now, if you've ever seen this done in the movies, they have to uh, Hollywood eyes it. And they make it in such a way that, you know, the people, usually there's about like a hundred of, of the Israelites, and they're running, and they, they barely make it out. And as the last Egyptian hand is about to grab their foot, then the water comes down, and whoo, close call. Listen to how Scripture records this. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen, and in the morning... So this took all night. Remember, over 600,000 men alone getting through this area. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. You ever seen that in any of these movies? Never. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. The Lord by his mighty hand rescued these people by supernatural, amazing strength. Does this still amaze you? You know, it was raining a little bit outside. Imagine, imagine if you will, if we walked out after the service, we walk outside and we see a puddle, a puddle of water. And when you walk up to it, suddenly it splits in half. You would grab your phone. You'd be trying to record this. It'd be on YouTube. The news would be out here. It'd be viral in moments. A puddle. God split the sea. And Paul tells us, all of them passed through. All the Hebrews made it across safely. Not one of them drowned with the Egyptians. He continues in verse 2. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What does that mean? Well, first, who is Moses? People may not know much about the Bible, but they will know the name Moses. Moses is a very important figure in Scripture. In fact, he's such uh, a recognized and prominent figure in Scripture that in the New Testament, they refer to the law as Moses, the law of Moses. Moses was no joke. You know, it is very likely that this was the most godly man on the face of the earth at this time. He had experiences with God that others did not have. He was given special grace and special mercy and special privileges that others were not given. He spoke to God face to face, as it were. To be baptized To be immersed, to be immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It was to be identified with Moses. It was as if to say, 
They were part of his congregation. It would be, it would be just to say they went to his church. You think of the, the, the honor of saying, oh yeah, I listened to Moses preach. I'm under his tutelage. I walk with him. When Moses walked through, they walked through. Under the cloud that Moses was under, they were under. And we're told, do not be unaware of these things. In fact, we're told that after they crossed through the Red Sea, that was chapter 14 where it talks about that. Chapter 15 of Exodus Verse 1, it says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. You know the song of Moses? The people sang it with him. I don't know how they knew all the words, but they sang it with them. They sang the song together. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 10. And all ate the same spiritual food. These people ate food. What was the food? It was the manna. Like I said, Tim touched on it this morning. This was given to them by God himself. Psalm 78, 25 puts it this way. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. I like how the King James says it. Man ate angels' food. This was miraculous. This was not just bread, <laughs> This was a miraculous food because it had certain criteria, certain things about it. For example, they were told whoever, whoever uh, gathered much had nothing left over. I believe this is Exodus 16. Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. So some people would gather a whole bunch, and they had nothing left over. And other people would only do a little bit, but they didn't lack any. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. But you know what uh, the thing about this manna? It says that when the sun would come out, it would melt. But they could bake it, and they could boil it, and it wouldn't melt. It would only last a day, and if they tried to hoard up some for the next day, you know what happened. It would stink. It would get worms. But on the Sabbath, it wouldn't. The idea, this was not just flakes of bread that were put on the ground. This was a supernatural gift by the hand of God that was also maintained by the power of God. And Paul tells all of us, I don't want you to be unaware. They all ate that. In fact, the only people on the face of the earth in all of history that ate manna were these people. Paul never ate manna. Peter never ate manna. Adam never ate manna. These people did. And he doesn't want us to be unaware of that. And I always think that it's such a kindness of God that he also made it taste good. You know, it, it says that it tasted like honey on wafers. I like sweets, so that's, that's right on. I mean, he could have made it taste like soggy cereal, or cauliflower, or Brussels sprouts, but he didn't. He made it taste good. So, they all were under the cloud. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. They all passed through the sea. All of them walked through. God's the one that kept the water back, crushed their enemies. They all ate the same spiritual food. And, what else? They all drank from the spiritual and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. And he actually gave them water from a rock. Now, I'm not a geologist, but you don't get water from rocks. I, I don't, you know, people dig, and they try to get deep in the ground, and they find, you know, hidden uh, springs and rivers underwater, and they get water that way. People make wells and all of that. But you don't go to a mountain and start pounding on the mountain and gushes of water come out. That's not how this works. Again, this was a supernatural gift from the very hand of God. God did this for them. But remember how many people we're talking about. 
again, sometimes this has been dramatized, and they have these little water fountain things coming out of a rock. 600,000 men, not including women and children, not including cattle. It, look, you got to water the, the cattle or they're going to die. This was enough water for all of them. God did this. This was amazing. The same thing with the manna. Think of how much manna was around. They had enough. Everybody ate. Everybody was nourished. Everybody was satisfied. Nobody went hungry. Nobody died of thirst. It doesn't even talk about here that he made sure that their clothes didn't shrink. That he protected them day in and day out from all the enemies around them. And then it says that this was actually pointing to a greater reality. That the, that the reality that this was just a type and a shadow, but the fullness was in Christ. They took part in a shadow that was pointing to the Messiah. What a thing that they would be so honored and blessed to be given such kindness, such grace and mercy and love from God. Okay, Paul, we see you. Okay, you don't want us to be unaware. Don't be ignorant. Don't be uninformed is what this word means. That our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Now, here comes the shock. Verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. These people had supernatural, amazing, powerful, God-ordained help and miracles and rescues. They had experiences. They had amazing testimonies that they could tell. Look at what God did. Everybody could see it. There's no question that God is the one that did this. They were identified with the most godly man alive. They were rescued from death and cruelty and slavery from the very, by the very hand of Yahweh himself. And yet, nevertheless, in spite of all of that, most of them went to hell. With most of them, God was not pleased. It doesn't say with a few of them. It doesn't say with some of them. It says with most of them. You know what that means? That most of the Israelites who were rescued from Egypt perished. That's, that's, that's a big deal. That's, that's not small potatoes. You say, okay, well, what does that have to do with me? It's 2015, almost 2016. I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. What does that have to do with me? Why should I not be uninformed about that information? How does that have any bearing upon my life? Much in every way. Because it means this. It means that it's possible to be in this church. It's possible to have had supernatural, amazing experiences. It's possible to read your Bible every day, pray every day, and still be an enemy of God and be cast into the lake of fire at the end. That's what that means. You can avoid what's bad and do what's good and still be destroyed by the Lord. These people were overthrown in the wilderness by God himself. Where it says he was not pleased, that doesn't mean, well, he just didn't like what they did. No, he says that he overthrew them. God made war against these people, and we'll see it as we keep going. He fought against them. So you, you may be processing in your mind, you may say, well, I, I know that the Lord guides me. I know that he leads me. I know that he's with me. I know he walks with me. He's been directing me all my life. 
And they can say, we were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You may say, but... But, but I've been saved from car wrecks and, and danger, seen and unseen, and I almost died, and God rescued me. I know I'm with God. And they can say, God rescued us from the Egyptians. You may say, but I listen to solid preachers. My, my family is Christian. I go to a good church. I go to Grace Community Church. And Pastor Tim and Pastor James and David and John, those are my pastors. And they can say, we were baptized with Moses. We stood on the very shore of the Red Sea with the Egyptians at our feet and sang the song of Moses with him. You may say, but, but I know I hear the voice of God I listen to good songs and sermons, and they could say, we heard God speak from the mountain. You may say, but he's provided for me when I had nothing. It was Christmas, and gifts showed up on our door, and I, my bills, my, my lights were about to be cut off. The eviction notice was on my door. I had no way, and God made a way for me. He provided for me. And they can say, he fed us manna. He quenched our thirst with water from a rock. You may say, I've had all these experiences. I know I'm saved. We read here that even though they were all under the cloud, walked through the water, were baptized into Moses, were fed manna and drank from a rock, with most of them God was not pleased and he destroyed them in the wilderness. Whatever experiences or miracles you can point to for a ground to stand on, they have one as well. And yet they perished, the majority of them. In fact, Paul tells us in the, it starts off with the word for, which means something came before this. What came before? Verse 27, but I discipline my body and keep it under some control, lest after preaching to others, I myself to be disqualified. R.C. Sproul says this about that verse. Paul was confident that absolutely nothing would be able to separate him from God's love, but he never presumed that he was saved regardless of what he did. No Christian can afford to take lightly the warnings of Scripture. It's as if people are saying, you know, Paul says, look, I don't... I don't want to have preached to others and I myself be disqualified. And people say, yeah, yeah, right. Wait a minute. You think this is not real? Let me remind you of what happened. Remember the Israelites? Remember all the experiences they had? And what did it lead to? Most of them were destroyed. This is like the Matthew 7 of the Old Testament. But Lord, Lord, didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I do mighty works in your name? Didn't I do many miracles? Didn't I prophesy? I never knew you depart from me. Okay, so Paul, you have our attention. The question I ask, and I'm hoping you're asking as I was reading through this is, why? What happened? How did we get here? How do they have all of that? obvious kindness and mercy and grace from God shown to them and they still perish what happened verse 6 we're told now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did so first off there is a thank you Lord because we could have been the people that were used as examples these people were used as examples to shed light for us that we might not follow in their footsteps. And what are we told here? That we might not desire evil as they did. Desire. What does that word mean? To crave, to lust, to covet to go after. These people had this result because this is what was in their heart. They had desires, they had lusts, they had cravings for evil. And Paul goes on to tell us exactly how those desires played out. Just like Jesus said, before you go and touch a woman, it starts in the heart. 
Before you go and murder somebody, it starts in the heart. The desire leads to the behavior. It's had everything to do with their desires. What did they crave for? Well, they had evil desires. They craved that. They desired evil. So let's look at what they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Again, he tells us, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. What is the instruction? What is the lesson? Do not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as they were did. Do not indulge in sexual immorality. Do not grumble. Do not put Christ to the test as some of them did. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed. Take heed to what? To these warnings. Take heed to the warnings, to the danger, to idolatry, to the danger of not taking serious your holiness, to not taking serious sin in God's name. These warnings. They wanted idols and not God. They wanted sexual sin and not God. They wanted to grumble. They wanted their own way. They didn't want God's will. And their hearts were set on doing their own thing. They had a reputation for being believers, for loving Him. They sang songs, offered sacrifices. They said that they would be faithful. They said that they feared Him. They said that they loved Him. They said that they would obey Him. I mean, if you read through just the book of Exodus, not even getting to Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, if you just read through the book of Exodus and you see over and over and over again the mercy, the kindness of God to them and how they kept going their own way. They would say one thing, but their hearts, their desires were evil and they would go after another. One moment... They're singing their love for him. The next moment, they're worshiping a golden calf. One moment, they're crying out for forgiveness and mercy. The next, they're putting God to the test. One moment, they're telling Moses, please, you speak to God on our behalf. The next moment, they want to kill Moses. We see them making vows to obey the Lord and keep his commandments. Then we see them worshiping the false gods of the pagans around them. I mean, this is something that, that we see in, in, in our own world, youth, some of, some of the young people, maybe even here, you come to church because your parents make you. You come to church and you play the games because it's what's expected of you. But you know that graduation is coming. You know college is coming. And once you get from under the oversight of your parents and the brethren, there is a desire in you to go after this world. And it's only being restricted now because it's being force restricted. It's as if there's a dog and this dog sees this big plate of bacon. And you know that dog wants that bacon. But he has a collar on him that if he goes towards it, it's going to shock him. He wants that bacon, but he's not going after it because this collar is shocking him. So he might show restraint because he doesn't want the shock. But you know if you take that collar off, what's going to happen? He's going to devour that plate as quick as possible. That was these people. They had a desire inside of them. And eventually it showed itself. So, let's look at these issues that Paul reminds us of that we might be instructed. Because there's a hope. 
there is a hope in me as one of your pastors. And we look around. And typically on a Sunday morning, it looks so encouraging. People have their Bibles. Everyone's talking about the Lord. People are showing up to the meetings. People are evangelizing. Everything looks so encouraging. But none of us knows what's truly in the hearts of another. You know when you're alone who you really are, what you really desire. When an opportunity is given to you and no one's watching, when temptation arises and you don't think anyone will find out about this, when you're alone with your computer or your phone or, or this person or whatever, whatever is inside, the desires, who you really are. I, I never forget, I heard Pastor Tim say this many times. He said, don't fool yourself. The person you are is the person you are when you're by yourself and no one's watching. That's who you really are. These are warnings meant to lead us away from destruction. So, verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They went after idols. As it was said this morning, after seeing the Lord move in miraculous ways, after seeing the plagues, the Red Sea, feeding them, pillar of cloud, all of that, they still went after idol idols. They still wanted idolatry. They wanted a God made in their own image. What, 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 do, what do idol worshipers really desire? I mean, they want their way. I heard somebody say, Okay, what is the definition of idolatry? And I thought it was helpful. Idolatry, think about what is your worst nightmare. What I mean is this. If this happened to you, you wouldn't want to live anymore. This is an actual letter from a student at a school that I've worked at. Listen to this. I don't want to live anymore. She is taking my friends and it's killing me. She makes me want to slit my wrist. It hurts. It burns. No one can save me this time. I have no boyfriend anymore. I want to cry a lot. She makes me think no one cares. You don't care. My friends don't care. My family doesn't care. She's so much cooler than me. So much more popular than me. If I died, nothing would change. This student has a God, and it is popularity, it is friends, it is boyfriends and girlfriends. And you might look at that and say, that's ridiculous. Why would she want to take her life? It's just a boyfriend and girlfriend, it's just some friends. You can find more friends. And yours may not be as obvious as that, but you ask yourself, the reality is some people have contracts with God and they say, I will follow you as long as you don't do this. As long as you do not take the life of my parent, as long as you do not take the life of my child, as long as I can continue to pursue this career, as long as I can have this amount of money, as long as I can have this dream, this vision, let me do this, I'll follow you. You take it, I'm gone. You don't have it written out on paper, but it is in your heart. And every time something gets close, every time a loved one gets sick, you start feeling it rise up. Are you going to do this? What is your worst nightmare? Because ultimately what is being said is, my life is centered around this thing. If my child dies without turning to the Lord and they perish, I'm done. You're saying, my life is centered around this thing. And if you take this thing, then my life is done. But for the Christian, our life is Christ. And unless Christ ceases being Christ, there is nothing that can happen to us on this earth that would ever make us say, that's it. I don't care anymore. Are there dark nights of the soul? There are. But these are moments 
Another test for idolatry is there's something you want. Will you sin to get it? Or will you sin if you can't have it? A good place to test us all is authority. Because authority usually tells us that we can't have something we want. So, when your authority in your life says no, do you sin to get it anyway? Children, your parents said, you see all this Christmas cookies and candy all around? You can't have it as you please. And you say, I want those candy canes. I want those cookies. They're not watching. They said no, but I want it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to sneak and get it when no one's watching. I'm going to eat it in the dark and I'm going to hide the evidence. Well, you just showed everybody what, who your God is. That's an idol. We all have authority in our lives. And there, there comes a point when our authority says no. Do you... <clears throat> Well, you're sinning, showing this thing is dominating your life. They were idolaters. They, have idol they had idolatry in their heart and they went after it. It's idolatry in your heart. Do you see the danger? Paul is telling us, I don't want you to be unaware that even though you can have all these experiences, if idolatry is in your heart unchecked, it will lead to the destruction that they had. Verse uh, 8. Some of them desired sexual sin. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Now, I don't need to talk long about this here. We don't need much convincing that our world is completely and totally engrossed in sexual sin. Whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, fornication or adultery, pornography or thoughts in the mind, it is everywhere. It's all over. It's evil. Do not let anyone deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. It is coming. The world tells you it's okay. It's normal. It's all right. You've got to try it out before you go there. The world is lying to you. God tells you the truth. This will end in destruction. Jesus says, because of this, I'm going to cast some people into hell. They will be thrown into hell. It's better to have your hand cut off, your eye plucked out, than to go into this thing and be thrown into the lake of fire. This world will prophesy, peace, peace. There is no peace. If you are playing around with sexual sin this leads to destruction this is a book uh, impure lust from john flavel i'm just going to read a, a a brief part of this he is urging in this book flee youthful lust stay away from sexual sin do not play around with it not even a hint and he comes here to argument eight, and he says, If you never repent, as indeed but few do that fall into this sin, then consider how God will follow you with eternal vengeance. You shall have flaming fire for burning lust. This is a sin that has the scent of fire and brimstone with it. Wherever you meet with it in Scripture, the harlot's guests are lodged in the depths of hell. No more perfumed beds, they must now lie down in flames. Whoremongers shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Such shall not inherit the kingdom of God in Christ. No dog shall come into the new Jerusalem. There shall in no wise enter in anything that defiles or that works abomination." You have spent your strength upon sin, and now God sets himself a work to show the glory of his power in punishing. The wrath of God is transacted upon them in hell by his own immediate hand. Because no creature is strong enough to convey all his wrath, it must all be poured out upon them. Therefore, he himself will torment them forever with his own immediate power. Now will he stir up all his wrath, and sinners shall know the price of their pleasures. If you're doing these things, leave it alone. Turn from it now while there is time. Be done with it before it consumes you. 
The scriptures warn that those who go into this home do not return. There is a reality that a lot of people who go towards this impure lust, sexual sin, many of them do not return. Beware. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? If you've been given grace like I have in my Christian walk, to be free from this, do not return. In verse 9, some of them put Christ to the test. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. They were basically looking at all the kindness of the Lord and stepping over it. How do they put Christ to the test? How? They call the man a worthless food. The Lord was so patient with them, he forgave them over and over and over again. He held back destruction on them again and again and again, yet they kept pushing him. They kept provoking him to anger. How? They stared in the face of all of his mercy, all of his gracious kindness, and they spit. They saw his wrath poured out upon the Egyptians. They saw how he dealt with his enemies. And in spite of all of that, they continued to go after their sin. I remember growing up, I used to hear people say, don't test me. I even heard my mother say that a few times. Don't test me, boy. You know what that means. You're this close. Patience has been given and you've stepped over it and smacked me in the face. Mercy has been given and you stepped over that and you smacked me in the face. There comes a point when God says enough. Time for patience is over. You have tested me. You have provoked me to anger and wrath and now you are going to receive what you have been asking for. I mean, that's the Israelites. You can think of your own life. How patient has the Lord been with you? How merciful has He been with you? How many opportunities has He given you to repent? How slow to anger has He been? How many times has He sent someone with a word calling you from your sin? And perhaps no one else knows, and you sit silently with secret sins, and you've been given warning after warning after warning after warning, Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Tuesday after Tuesday, you've heard it again and again and again, and you keep holding on secretly, hiding it like Achan, thinking no one will know, and yet they called him by tribe, they called him by clan. They called them by the father's house and they called them by the man. And it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer to you. And time is given now. Turn. You're putting Christ to the test. He is slow to anger, but he does have anger. And you don't want to see it. Have you not read what it says in Romans? Do you not or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And people often stop reading there, but it goes on. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Why? Because your desire is for you. Again, this is about desires. Pharisees, they had outward obedience, inwardly desire evil. What is inside? Where are your desires? In verse 10, we've already heard much about this. Some of them grumbled, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, I'm not going to re-preach James's message, and he touched on it again today. Excellent. I just want you to consider a couple of things. Grumbling is not just an action. Grumbling is a conversation that you are having with God. Because we believe that God is all sovereign, right? We would say all things, all things are 
completely and totally under his power. He does what he pleases. The Lord is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases in heaven, on earth, in the seas, and all the deeps. Why is it cold outside? Because the Lord wants it to be cold. Why is it as hot as fish grease outside sometimes? Because God wants it to be that hot. When we grumble, we're saying, I don't like how you do things, God. You don't know what you're doing. Why is my baby crying at four in the morning and her baby sleeps eight hours every single night? Why? Because the sovereign hand of God said for it to be so that he might be glorified and you might be conformed to the image of Christ. That's why. But when we grumble against that, you're saying, you don't know how to glorify yourself. I do. You don't know how to help me be more conformed to your image. I have a better way. And my way is for my child to sleep all night and not cry. We wouldn't dare say this with our lips. But it's being said nonetheless. And when this happened in the congregation, in the company of the Israelites, when they started grumbling about food, Moses said this in Exodus 16, 8, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. So even when people are doing things, and you say, I don't like what you're doing, I'm stuck in traffic. I grumble. I sin when I do that. I say, I have a better way of doing this, Lord. Let, let, let me instruct you on how this should be played out. I should be able to exit now instead of sitting in traffic for an hour. Do you see the blasphemy of grumbling? We are having a conversation when we grumble because, like we heard, God is listening. We're telling to Him his, to His face. Your will isn't perfect, it's flawed. And if I was running things, I would do things much better. Ah. What do they desire? Their way, their will, their pleasure. Not God, not Christ, not His glory. And regardless of all that they had experienced, they perished. So, what do you desire? Do you desire Christ? Do you really love Him? Do you really love Him? Do you love what's in His hand? Or do you love Him? Do you love what's on the Master's table? Or do you love the Master of the house? Do you love Christ? Do you desire Christ? Do you want His will? They desired evil and they were destroyed. These things happen for our instruction. Your religious activity doesn't matter if your desires are evil. Your experiences don't matter if you desire sin and the world. Your performance is worthless if you don't love Christ. And Christians are people who love Christ, people who strive to please Jesus. We can find some good news in this. One is the warning itself. But two, we can find good news in verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. Notice it doesn't say with all of them. So that's good news. There is a reality that there were those amongst them that were faithful. And as it is true in every church, and in our church, I know there are faithful brethren You love Jesus, men, women, children that have been gloriously saved, and you love Christ above all, and you want to honor him, and you don't want to displease him, and you know like I know, there is nothing, nothing, as we were singing the song all this morning, knowing you, there's nothing greater than knowing you, and we know the reality that there's nothing that grieves our hearts more than when we fall. Nothing causes our hearts to be broken more than when we sin against the Lord that we love. Nothing causes our heads to be hung more than we know that we have displeased Him. Even if nobody else knows, we know 
This isn't about being embarrassed amongst the church. It's because he, he died for us and we love him and we don't want to displease him. Sin is not your desire anymore. There was a time when it was. There was a time when you woke up Friday, you couldn't wait to get off work because you knew the weekend. Oh, I'm going to just, I'm going to squeeze all the sin I can out of this weekend. We sinned with a laugh. We sinned with joy. We spit in his face and enjoyed it. That was what it used to be. Christ has saved many in this room. And because of that, now we love him and we hate our sin. We long for heaven. One of the reasons Christians long for heaven more than being free from pain and suffering and sorrow and all that is because we know we will be free from sin and we will be able to love him unhindered, unrestricted, completely and totally pure. Our fellowship with him will be completely and totally pure without any of our sin. We long for that day when we can look at his face, where we can wrap our arms around him. We long for the day when we can just fall at his feet and worship and no sinful thoughts come to our head. No devil coming with temptations. No dark clouds when we pray in the dark. None of that. Just freedom to love him. Sin is not a small thing for you. It's a big thing. You don't even want to let a little bit of sin in your life. If you allow me to tell a story from the men's retreat, um, <laughs> me and Adonijah and Isaiah and Juan and Carlos, y'all know what happened, uh, we went on a walk and we, were, we had some machetes and there was some cactus plants and we might have been cutting the cactus plants. It's a men's retreat, so we were having fun. Um, Now, there might have been a moment where some of us started throwing cactus plants at each other so that we could cut it with (laughs) the machete. This might have happened. Um, One of them might have hit Juan in the back of the head because he wasn't looking. I'm not going to name any names who did that, Carlos. Um, (laughs) Uh... So what happened? He has all these thorns now in the back of his head and his neck on his shoulder. And we are, we are trying. You know what I mean? We feel so bad. It's, it's funny, but it's not funny. And so we're, we're trying to pull these things out of the back of our brother's head and neck and shoulder. And we, we were there, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes, just trying to get all that we could. And we thought we got them all. But then he told me um, at church that when he went home, he still had more. And his wife helped him pull out every single one. But we couldn't see them. They were so tiny, we couldn't see them. But he felt them. And he had no peace until every single thorn was taken out. That's the Christian. When God saved us, indeed, pornography, hatred, unforgiveness, anger, we get rid of all that. But there are tiny sins. There are respectable sins that we say not even a hint. We must get all of these out. We pluck them up from the root because we have no peace. We cannot sin against somebody and be okay with it. We go for every single one. We go after them with vengeance. We must do so because we desire to have nothing between my soul and the Savior. Isn't this your heart's desire? Psalm 21, 2, you have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. What is the request of our lips? Lord, we want to see you. We want to love you. We want to know you. We want to know you more. Yes, we know you, but we want to know you more. We love you, but we want to love you more. We desire closer and closer and closer. Can we get closer still? That's our desire. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We, de- we delight ourselves in him and the desire of our heart is that we will find more delight in him. Oh yes, God, you could give, you could, uh, it's, like, it's like Solomon, you know, oh money and house, all that stuff's nice. But the reality is we want you. 
We want you more than anything else. Please, Lord, give us this. Give us greater, greater understanding, greater joy, greater affection. Lord, when we read your word, why are we reading it? Because you're in there. When we pray, why are we praying? Because we want to talk to you. It's all about Christ. This is the true desire of the believer. In Psalm 145, 19, it says, He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Think, this is us, the Christians, the brethren, those who love Jesus, who truly want him. We desire Jesus. You think about what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Indeed, all who desire a godly life in Christ Jesus, to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. And we see, yes, there comes persecution, but what is the desire? I desire to live a godly life in Christ. That's the desire of my heart. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You ever been around a baby who was hungry and didn't have milk? There's no peace in that house until that baby gets that milk because there's a desire there. Christians are people who desire God's word. We desire intimacy with him. We desire fellowship with him. We desire intimacy with the brethren. We want to be amongst the people of God. We, we can say amen, like David said, as the deer pants for flowing streams. So pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When, when shall I come and appear before God? So where are you? Remember, this isn't about what people think about you. What everyone thinks about you doesn't really matter. Remember, the Israelites had a great reputation. Those are the people of God. That is the peculiar nation. They are chosen by God. Those are the people that have been fed with manna from heaven. These are the people that God destroyed the Egyptians. He opened the sea for them. They had a reputation amongst all the people around for all of these great things. But what was inside of them? They were filled with evil desires. What do you really desire? Don't worry about people's thoughts here. This has to do with your soul. Children, you're growing up in these Christian homes and you can can parrot all of the, the words and sing all the songs, and you can sit there with your Bible and act like you're paying attention, but what is truly in your heart? Do you really desire Christ, or are you looking at that window like, oh, I want to be out there in the world? Are you lying to everybody, to your mother, to your father, to your friends, to the pastors? Are you lying to yourself? Because you know what you really want. Do you really love Christ above all things? Or do you want to be popular among this world? Do you want the riches and the fame and the glory that this world promises? Do you come to church just to fulfill the religious duty? Do you come because your parents make you? Do you come because everybody just expects this of you? And you're too ashamed to say, This is who I really am. I really don't love Jesus. I've been pretending all these years. I'm confident that some of you will really follow Christ to death, even no matter what. You want Jesus above all because your desire is for him. You love him because you see what he's given up for you. You see what he suffered for you, and that matters to you. And if you love him with all your heart, I I just want to encourage you, run even harder. You look at anything in your life that might be holding you back, even a moment, even a fraction from loving him more, give it up. It's not worth it. This time is so short. Eternity is coming, and it's coming soon. And you'll look back in eternity and say, why did I hold on to that? When I could have had more of him. You know, if you'll excuse this illustration and then we'll be coming to an end. I was talking to my children on Christmas morning. 
It's about what Jesus did. And I started thinking, and I was talking to him. I said, what, what, is, the, what, what is the one place that you don't want to be at for a very long time? And they had some different ideas. And I said, for me, it's filthy bathrooms. When I was in India, oh, you, the places are so bad, you don't want to walk in there with your shoes. They're that bad. The smells, the sights, it's all disgusting. It's putrid. But imagine walking into a place like that and laying down on the floor. Imagine all the filth of that place being poured upon you. You would be horrified. You would be disgusted. The very idea of it is enough to cause the wincing of the face. As bad as you can imagine that being, you think of what Christ did. He who is pure. He was perfect. He came to this filthy world. And I don't mean just the filth of smells, and there was that. And he was truly born in a barn where there was manure and everything else around. I don't just mean the, the physical reality of the filth, but what happened to him on the cross? Did he not bear our sins? Did he not take upon him all the filth and the grief and the sorrow and the shame of our wickedest evenings, of our most horrific deeds? He took that upon himself. More shameful than anything, any bathroom in this world can offer was poured upon his holy and perfect head. Jesus did this. And not only that, but then he took the full weight and anger and fury and wrath of his father and he did it for his enemies. And that has penetrated the hearts of many of you in this room. And because of that, you love him. Love him, love him, love him. He's worthy of everything you have to give. But I close now just with a word for those who don't know him. If you're in here and you really don't, you're tired of pretending that you do. Have you been looking at your experiences and all your works and all these things that have happened to you in your life as evidence that you really are good with God? Look again and see that you're standing on spider webs and they're breaking all around you and beneath you are the very flames of hell. The ground around you is weak, it's falling, and you've been jumping up and down upon it for years. But there in the distance, there is the cross. There is Christ. And He beckons you to come, but He tells you to come now. Because all around you, the spider webs are beginning, they're beginning to break and snap. And time is short, and you do not know when it's going to fall beneath your feet. But if you come now, He promises that all who come to Him will not be cast out. There is mercy now. There is salvation now if you come. You cannot be promised later, for later is not promised. But if you come now, oh, the door of the ark indeed is closing and is being closed by the Lord Himself. Do not wait until it closes to bang on the door and ask for an entrance. Now is the time to run in while it remains opened. The Israelites perished, many of them, most of them. But you don't have to. Be instructed, be warned, and run to the one who is merciful, Christ. He's willing, he's able to save you from all you've done. Father, Lord, where our hearts have not desired you, would you forgive us? Lord, would you forgive us for when our hearts desired other things? Lord, would you give us greater desire for Christ? Would you keep us from desiring evil as they did? Thank you that you've given us instruction and warning that we might not fall 
as they fell. But Father, to those who have been only wearing the mask of the Christian, to those who have only been going through the motions, who have been here with us but have not been of us, Lord, would you show them the reality of their soul that they might fall and cry out for mercy and salvation. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.